So to get started, I figured there's no better way to really kick this off than dive into just the winemaking process and how we go from grape to bottle. Now I'm gonna bookend this basically with the fermentation process and how we operate once grapes are picked and we're gonna end with the aging process. I'm not gonna talk too much about blending and bottling. I'm not gonna talk really at all about the farming side of things. We're just gonna do kind of a step-by-step, -step, in essence, kind of wine for dummies guide of how we go from you know a grape to a wine that's aging in barrel or in tank. Uh, there's going to be a lot of wiggle room in what I say. And this is why you have so many wineries in the Napa area, in California, and in the world as a whole, is because everything I'm about to go into, there's a level of variability to it. There is very much kind of intense wine manufacturing. It's very by the book, by the numbers. And then you have on the opposite end of that spectrum, kind of the quote unquote natural wine movement, which is basically pick grapes, let the wine make itself and have zero intervention whatsoever. A lot, and I mean a lot, if you know, definitely the vast majority of producers land somewhere in the middle of that. Those are definitely the extremes. You know, if you're a Gallo family making tens of millions of cases of wine a year, you're having to it's more manufacturing. Uh, I equate it to, and I use this analogy all the time in tastings, is that you know there's a reason a Big Mac tastes like a Big Mac. There's a reason why Carlo Rossi tastes like Carlo Rossi. It's not a bad thing or a good thing, it's just the way it is, because that's the brand identity, that's the style, it has to stick to it. You're not gonna see it you know, change and kind of ebb and flow with the vintages. It's meant to be kind of a set thing. Uh, you also have folks on the natural wine side of things that, you know, because the wine is in essence making itself, there's a lot of variability there. You're not exactly sure what you're going to get year in and year out. Sure, they have their house style and they try and kind of stick to it. But because they're not controlling hardly any of the variables outside of maybe the harvest date, there's going to be a lot more variability in that. And this is really the tug of war of that science of manufacturing versus the art of winemaking. And it's up to you as a winemaker or myself when I started MTJ of where I want to fall. Is it further to one side, further to another, or is it somewhere in the middle where it's more of a balancing act? I can tell you that it is certainly more of a balancing act. I tend to lean more on the art form than anything else, but I'm of the opinion that you have to have a really solid background in the science to be able to make a good wine because if you lean too far on the art and you don't know how to fix a particular problem, then you're going from bad to worse in your winemaking very, very quickly. On the other hand, if you're very strict and high and tight on the science side of things and you are not allowing for any variability, then you're kind of stuck in this realm where, yeah, you're going to make a okay or a good wine, but that wine might not ever be great. Great wines, in my opinion, are exponentially better than good wines. And good wines are exponentially better than okay wines. And if you wanna move up that steep scale, you have to have some variability. You have to have an X factor of some sort. You have to have something that reaches out and grabs people and makes your wine truly interesting. And I don't think you can get there by manufacturing a wine. Many have tried. I think all of them have failed, to be completely honest. Now, there are always exceptions. That should go without saying, but that's kind of my overview of winemaking just in general. But what about the step-by-step -step process? How do I make some of these judgment calls and what do I think of some of these judgment calls and in within the science and the art of winemaking? And you know, where, where does MTGA fall? Where do other people fall? I mean, let's get into it a little bit, shall we? So without further ado, ba -ba 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 Oop, whoop, too far. There we go. Uh, so this is a very simple, just, whoop, here we go. Let me make this full screen. Uh, so this is just a very simple illustration uh, from winefolly.com. I actually really like their stuff. It's some really good kind of educational material, uh, really basic stuff like this, where it's just very top line, kind of go through the process. Uh, we don't have a partnership or anything. This is just, I like what they did here. Um, so I'm using it as a reference. Um, you can find a link to this in our uh, description of this video, as well as some other stuff that we're gonna get into as we go through this process. Now, I mentioned we're gonna use 
the bookends of this conversation would be really the fermentation process as well as the aging process. We're not going to get into the blending bottling. We're not getting into farming. We'll be saving those topics for another time. So let's start with the fermentation process. I got to remember that I got to point this way to show you what's on the screen over there. I'm working on it. We're live, basically. So the alcoholic fermentation. When grapes arrive at the winery, we have all kinds of things that we can do. Uh, now, if we're making a red wine like we are in this particular graphic, typically what's going to happen is that those grapes are going to be destemmed, they're going to be crushed, and they're going to go into a vessel of some sort, whether that's a barrel, a tank, an amphora, a concrete egg. There's all kinds of different vessels that we can use to conduct a fermentation. Uh, some of them can have open tops where you're doing punch downs. Some can be basically enclosed tanks where you're doing pump overs. There's a million different options, basically. And you'll find that wineries employ multiple of these to create different lots within the same program. So that's something that is just more of a stylistic consideration. Uh, if you're making typically a larger lot, you're likely going to use a stainless steel tank that's temperature controlled. You might use more of a concrete vat if you're a little bit more old school or maybe an open top tank that you can still temperature control, but is a little bit more open to the elements, you know, to each their own. And this is just more of a stylistic consideration of how you want to operate or if you're hired on as a winemaker somewhere, just the equipment you have on hand and you got to make it work. Uh, this is something that is very common throughout the wine industry. You know, the fermentation vessel and how you're going to conduct this alcoholic fermentation is going to be very variable. All kinds of ways to go about it. Before we actually get that fermentation process going, though, as we're destemming and crushing those grapes, there is one stylistic consideration that you might go through. And that is what we call a cold soak. Uh, a cold soak is when you crush those grapes, they go into typically a stainless steel tank or a vessel that can be temperature controlled and they're chilled down uh, so that they're well preserved. You're typically adding a low dose of sulfites at this point as well to keep the wine stable. You don't want anything growing in there. You don't want anything, any fermentations kicking off. And that low dose of preservatives helps inhibit some of that as well as the cold temperature. The reason you do this cold soak is primarily for color. Uh, this cold soak over the course of 48, 72 hours is going to bring out more blue and purple hues in the wine. So it can create this kind of nice, really dark, dense looking juice. Whereas if you go right into a fermentation process, it might be a little bit more like dark red or like ruby in color, uh, depending on the extraction you're getting from the skins. So it's more of a stylistic consideration. It really, in my opinion, doesn't do anything for the overall enjoyment of the, of the wine other than it looks nice. Uh, it's something that is, you know, fine to do. Uh, it's something that we don't do at MTGA at all. Uh, we inoculate our fermentations with yeast right away just to kind of get them up and running. Uh, but, you know, it's something we have done for clients and, and working for other wineries in the past. I've done plenty of cold soaks. It's not a bad thing to do. It's just a kind of an extra step in the process. Uh, you're usually delaying the start of your fermentation by a few days. It's really no harm, no foul, as long as you can temperature control your tank. If you can't do that, you're not cold soaking because, as the name implies, it's got to be cold. So, you know, it's I, I do feel, and this is kind of a side note, that and I've said this to multiple colleagues and many of them agree with me. I don't know if they'd say it publicly, but you know, anecdotally, I, I do think that the color of a wine is arguably the biggest red herring when it comes to evaluating the overall quality of wine. The exception to that, of course, is if you're deductively trying to evaluate that wine. If you're tr if you're doing a blind tasting, you're trying to decide maybe how old that is, that wine is, what region and variety that wine is, then the color of that wine and what it looks like can play a pretty significant role. But if you're just drinking for the overall enjoyment of a wine, I would say it's okay to, argue, to ignore the color completely. Just swirl it, smell it, take a sip, and if you enjoy it, great. Now, if you open up, you know, a big bottle of Cabernet and it's brown coming out, it might be over oxidized. You know, there are extremes that you may have more of a problem than a good wine in front of you. Um, if you see something that is, you know, super, super dark and jammy and, and dense and it stains your you know, teeth purple, you know, that's something else. So 
the color of a wine can play a role, but realistically, is it gonna affect your overall enjoyment of the wine? Probably not, unless you're actively trying to evaluate that wine, what it is, where it's from, how old it is, and so on and so forth. So the cold soak kind of leans into that where it's more so for stylistic purposes and what the wine looks like, but what the wine looks like does not translate to your overall enjoyment of it. Uh, whenever I'm evaluating a wine, I typically ignore the color unless it's egregiously something else that it should not be. You know, if I stumble upon a blind tasting and a wine is orange, then I'm like, okay, then this is something I, cause I immediately know, all right, this is a white wine that likely had some skin contact and now it has this weird hue to it, you know, but I'm, again, that's kind of this deductive method of figuring out, you know, Hey, this wine is X or was made in such and such a style. So it kind of gives you some insight into how the wine was made. It's not really foolproof. It just kind of is what it is. And again, it's more for style than anything else. Hey Ralph, how's it going? So that tangent aside, you know, the cold soak is something that is something that's employed by many, many folks. It's not good. It's not bad. It just kind of is what it is. And it's a stylistic consideration for what someone's trying to do and what they want their wine to look like. Now, if for us, and even once you get done with said cold soak, if that's something you're doing, then you're getting into that alcoholic fermentation. The alcoholic fermentation is conducted by simply adding yeast and warming up, you know, that juice so that that yeast can get going. Uh, typically, the fermentations need to be above 55 degrees, and you don't really want them to go above 90 degrees. A lot of folks will say don't go above 85. However, in that 85 to like 90 degree range, you can get some really nice phenolic development in your wine. It's a little bit riskier because the excessive heat can kill off the yeast that's in that fermentation. So it's kind of walking the edge of the knife a little bit. Typically, if I am taking a sample of a fermentation and it's saying 85 degrees, I know probably the core temperature of it's closer to 90. So I might want to chill it down a little bit. But for the most part, if it's in the low to mid 80s, I'm not super worried about it. We're just going to let it ride. Uh, now for us, and what a lot of folks will do is we will pitch a cultured yeast into the fermentation. Uh, this is, they basically come in these like freeze dried big old packets uh, where we can measure out a specific amount of yeast that we want to use based on the volume of the juice that's in the tank. Uh, so if you know you have, let's say, 200 gallons of wine, you can sit measure out, you know, X amount of yeast and say, oh, this is enough yeast to ferment that much wine. You know, it's kind of a ballpark, but it, it kind of, you know, gives you a little bit more of that, you know, scientific backbone of, you know, kind of like baking. It's like, hey, if, you, if you're trying to make X, let's make sure you add Y to get to Z, right? So it's a little bit more of the recipe there. Uh, in that same light, when you're adding yeast, you may test for something like the yeast, I'm going to say this wrong because I say it wrong all the time, the yeast assimilable nitrogen. That's this guy right here, right above my head here. Uh, this is basically, nitrogen is the main nutrient that yeast needs to conduct an efficient fermentation. So if you don't have enough yan in your wine, you are kind of asking for trouble, your fermentation might not go all the way through. Uh, this is something that I you, we can test for. It's very easy to do. And there are more than a couple of basically yeast vitamins that we can add as a nutrient to make sure that you have plenty of nitrogen to go around. Now, I will say when it comes to that, there are kind of a few couple foolproof ways and that is if your fermentation is getting stinky or getting sluggish, you know that there's some kind of issue. And as long as you're checking up on your fermentations regularly, it's pretty hard to screw up. I know plenty of people that say, hey, I just need my yan to be X number. Uh, basically, this is going to be really geeky because we're going to get into some of the numbers here. But you want, you know, I think it's in the neighborhood of like 125 milligrams per liter or less is when you start to have issues. I might be wrong on that. It might be per hectoliter, uh, but either way, you want to make sure that you have plenty of it. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, there we go. So yeah, it looks like it's about at least 125. But 
what you're really looking for is probably like I know someone that I've worked for in the past is they wanted like 250. Like the, the yen number needs to be at 250 milligrams no matter what because that's just that's that makes sure that I'm not going to have any issues when it comes to these, you know, nitrogen, you know, potential problems, basically. So you can supplement it with, you know, all kinds of things, basically. Um, realistically, it's just we call it yeast food. It's just something that it's a multivitamin to make sure that they have plenty of nutrients to carry out that fermentation process. Some folks will test and measure for that uh, in a big way to make sure that that fermentation goes all through. Some folks will ignore it completely and they'll just kind of ad lib. Uh, that's one of those things where it's kind of the art versus the science. Uh, I've seen fermentations with a good yen number get stuck and have problems. Uh, so it's not foolproof, but it can kind of help if you have a batch of juice that has a low level of nitrogen in it. So that got a little nerdy, uh, but that's one of the considerations that you might make in starting your fermentation is one, what yeast are you using? Two, how much food does it actually have to get that fermentation process done? And if it doesn't have enough food, you can supplement with one of these yeast supplements, basically. Very clean, very simple. Um, all of that uh, is eaten up and anything that uh, you know falls out of solution becomes heavy leaves or sediment and it's filtered out. Uh, there's nothing really it's just kind of the natural way of doing things well actually that's not true natural winemakers would have a point, bone to pick with that statement it's not the natural way of doing things but it's a very normal way that wine is made commercially around the world uh i know ralph i know i know i couldn't pronounce yeast assimilable nitrogen i still can't he's always a critic anyway once you've kind of dialed in how you want that fermentation to go, you know, what yeast you're using, uh, maybe it, you need to doctor it up with a little bit of those supplements to get that fermentation to go all the way through, you're ready to start that fermentation. Now, we did mention natural winemaking, and that is something where there is a natural yeast that can form in the vineyard. And you can basically crush grapes, warm up the tank, and let the wine make itself. Um, this is something that I've done in the past uh, for our Pinot Noir in particular. We did a little bit with our Cabernet in the past as well. Quite frankly, I'm not a fan of it. Uh, it's something that is argued can make more complex aromatics in the wine. This is something that actually is said uh, here uh, in this article as well, that natural yeasts are more challenging but often result in more complex aromatics. Challenging is not the word I would use. I would also not say that it makes more complex aromatics. Uh, I think the cultured yeast that we use, uh, which all come from this family of yeast, the Saccharomyces cerevisiae here, uh, you know, the cultured yeast that we use do a perfectly good job of creating complexity within a wine. Natural yeasts don't make a wine more complex. In fact, I'm of the opinion that natural yeast can cause typically more problems than they do solutions in a wine. I know there's probably a lot of natural winemakers out there that are going to hate this statement. Them is the ropes. That's how I feel. Uh, the only reason I feel this way is because I've done some A-B testing with it. And to be quite honest, the fermentations that I've managed to a T while doing a natural fermentation have always had problems. And the ones that where I've, you know, added a cultured yeast like of Saccharomyces cerevisiae to that fermentation have had far less problems. Uh, it just comes from personal experience. This is very anecdotal. Um, I also don't think that the fermentations that were done in a natural way for us uh, were any more or less complex than with the cultured yeast. I think they're just different. Uh, the big problem with using natural yeast is one, you're not exactly sure typically what yeast is out there. Two, there might not be enough of it or enough nutrients, to, again, as we were talking about, to get that fermentation to go all the way through. It, they can create all kinds of problems uh, when it comes to VA and acetic acid and basically making your wine have more of, of a vinegary uh, characteristic than not. Um, if that's what you're into, no harm, no foul. Uh, my bigger bone to pick with natural winemaking is that there's no set of rules or regulations behind it. Everyone kind of makes it up as they go, but that's going to be a different story for a different time. So 
Once you have that fermentation going, you've added yeast, things are bubbling along, you're creating a few different things in that fermentation vessel. One is you're creating alcohol. That sugar is getting eaten up. And basically, I always imagine it being like Pac-Man, just eating up little molecules of sugar. This is what I get for being a gamer. I'm a total nerd. Uh, two, you're getting some carbon dioxide, and it's actually like bubbling and foaming. If you've followed us on Instagram at all, you've seen some of these photos and videos as we're doing punch downs and mixing up these fermentations, how kind of foamy it is. Uh, two, you're creating, uh, three, you're creating some heat. There, it's off gassing quite a bit. Uh, that's why we mentioned kind of that fermentation range of like eh, around maybe not higher than like 85, maybe a little bit higher than 85 degrees Fahrenheit uh, before you want to back it off a little bit. Uh, the red wine fermentations generally have happen at a fairly warm temperature compared to your white wine fermentations uh, because you can lose some aromatics with these kind of hot and fast fermentations. It's kind of a stylistic thing. I've had some white wine fermentations go by very, very quick and the aromatics are fine. Uh, I've had some red wine fermentations last like three days. Uh, kind of the rule of thumb is that's like 14 to 21 days. Uh, but the wine has tasted just fine. So again, like there's there's always this little bit of wiggle room. And as much as you might want to say, oh, winemaking for dummies says A, B, C, D, or UC Davis says A, B, C, D, there's a lot of wiggle room once you kind of apply these things in a practical manner. Uh, so even if a fermentation goes a little faster than it should or even a little slower than it should, that's not, not necessarily a cause for concern as long as you know what you're tasting and smelling, what you're looking at. Uh, that's just kind of them as the ropes. Uh, this is very much where I take hold of the artistic side of winemaking and just let things run a little bit more. And I don't worry about a set timeline. If a fermentation doesn't finish in 14 days, I'm not worried about it. Uh, in fact, this is very typical is that when we do some of our heavier pressing, which is the next stage, look at that segue, we're so good. Uh, when we get into pressing this wine, uh, once the fermentation is done and the wines are going dry, uh, which is something I should point out, when we talk about dryness in a wine, it refers only to the sugar level in the wine. Uh, it has nothing to do with the tannins and how dry it feels. It has only everything to do with the, the sugar level is what we talk about when we're talking about dryness. And there's a scale for that. Uh, my best example of it right now is that if you go to your local grocery store, you might be able to find like the low calorie wines like Cupcake makes. And it's like only two grams of sugar per glass. So say there's eight to 10 grams per bottle of sugar in their low calorie wine. Uh, in a bottle of Armour Low, there's less than 0.3 grams. That's zero point decimal you know three grams per liter uh big difference you know in those two uh, again not saying it's good or bad one way or the other that's just what they're advertising and what our lab reports say uh, yeah them is the ropes so when we get to pressing though when that fermentation is going dry and there's so little sugar left that it's starting to slow down and probably finish up when you do squeeze some of these grapes and you start putting that you know now fresh wine into barrels or maybe another tank you're going to get a little bit more a little influx of sugar towards the end because you have berries that maybe didn't pop all the way uh, when you're crushing them uh, and as a result there's kind of this little bump up of sugar and then your fermentation continues a little bit longer uh, this is typically why I actually press off my wines when they hit like 1% or so of sugar left because that fermentation, that fermentation is still rolling at a pretty decent clip. And when I go into barrel and that fermentation is still rolling, it finishes out that last little bump of sugar I found, you know, pretty decently. Uh, that way you don't have to worry about a bunch of sugar hanging around, you know, into the winter months. Uh, although that can happen. Uh, there have been years where there's like one barrel where it's like, oh, it's January in the new year and this barrel is still sweet. And you're like, Ugh, what do I do? Um, but typically it's too cold for that fermentation to keep going. And we've had, you know, spring fermentations happen where a few months later down the line, well after this fermentation should have been done, when the cellars warm up a little bit, these fermentations get going again. And all of a sudden you have barrels uh, start bubbling. This actually happened in December of 2022. 
uh, we had kind of a cold stretch through early December, a bunch of rainfall, things of that nature. And then over the Christmas holiday, it warmed up like quite a bit. And all of a sudden you would go into the cellar and you would hear like a thump in the background. And that was because bungs were popping off of barrels because some of these fermentations and malactic ferment, the malactic fermentation, we'll get into that in a sec, typically doesn't make enough pressure for like bungs to pop off, like sometimes maybe, but uh, typically it's the primary fermentation because that CO2 that's trying to escape has nowhere to go and the bung just shoots out of the barrel and you just hear it pop off. So for a couple of weeks in the winter months, we're like walking through the cave, just looking at barrels to see if all the bungs are still in place because that, that primary fermentation and there can be finishing up because there's still a little bit of sugar, the yeast are still working, and we're just kind of patiently waiting. Again, this is definitely more of the art form of winemaking. We did not take this typical like 21 days to finish a red wine. We're like, if it needs more time, it needs more time. Uh, this is not something where we're kind of going by the recipe anymore. It's more so let's just make sure that this fermentation is continuing to move and we'll go from there. And if for some reason it gets stuck and the fermentation stops and the wine is still sweet, we have an order of operations of how to get it going again. I've had to do it before. It's a huge pain in the ass, but it works and you can get that wine to finish up. It's really not that big of a deal. It just is more work in the cellar, typically. It's not so bad. So once we're pressing things off, it's going into this little section in the middle here going to be the aging process we're talking you know concrete once again we're talking oak barrels which is what we use primarily all french oak um, you can talk about uh you know stainless steel you can talk about amphoras all kinds of different vessels uh really depends on what you're trying to do what flavors and characteristics you're trying to elicit all that good stuff so uh, all kinds of stylistic considerations here you know, we use French oak because it tends to be a lot more subtle on our wine, red wines. Uh, it has this really nice kind of mellow impact on them. It doesn't overwhelm or define them, but it's this nice little dash of spice, you know, a little, little something for the effort. Uh, just it adds a great X factor to the wine rather than becoming a defining characteristic. So we'll typically press off all of our red wine into once or twice used barrels first, and then we'll rack into newer barrels come January or February the following year. So we skipped a step, but we'll get to racking here in a second. So the malolactic conversion. This is very simply put, this is a conversion of acids. So you're taking malic acid, think of like a Granny Smith green apple and biting into that, malic acid. And then converting it to lactic acid. There's actually, uh, it's more of a conversion rather than a fermentation. And there's a bacteria that helps us do this. It's nothing to be scared of. It's totally normal. Uh, this is also where you're going to get like that buttery characteristic in some of your white wines. So if you're looking for that kind of rich buttery style of white wine, you let it go through this malactic conversion. If you want it to be more crisp and refreshing, then you don't. You know, that's the white wine stylistic thing pretty much all of your red wines are going to go through this. The reason for that is because they have enough structure as it is. There's going to be plenty of acidity left in those wines, number one. Number two, you have the tannin structure, as well as sometimes a higher alcohol. Uh, you know, there's plenty of structure to go around in these wines. The acidity is not something you need necessarily as a backbone, although I have, I'm of the opinion that a little bit of a higher acidity can really help balance out a, a big red wine really nicely. You know, so, but even then, we still let the malactic fermentation go all the way through in our red wines. Uh, the reason why, like, the acidity in our wines tends to be a little higher is simply because I harvest earlier than a lot of folks. So our pH level tends to be a little lower, the acidity a little higher. It's an inverse relationship uh, between those two, typically. Uh, that will be another kind of more in-depth talk about harvest, kind of how we schedule it, and kind of the considerations that I have when it's time to pick grapes. Uh, so this malolactic conversion uh, typically takes like a month or so. Um, it can take longer. We've had malolactic fermentations finish up in the spring of the following year. And it's really nothing that we're that concerned about as long as the wine is stable. Um, if you're looking at the chemistry of the wine and there's anything like uh, the VA or the pH that's creeping up too high, you know, I, there's just stuff that you want to keep an eye on to make sure that your wine is stable 
and that you're making a good quality wine. And if those numbers are out of whack, this is something you need to knock out sooner rather than later. Um, there are plenty of folks that just inoculate for this, very similar to how we inoculate you know, with yeast to get the primary fermentation going, that alcoholic fermentation going. And they just try and bang this out as quickly as possible because they don't want any additional risk. It's a totally viable way to do it. Um, it's a very easy thing to do. Uh, we have you know, enough of it, in essence, floating around the winery that typically our malactic conversions happen as the primary fermentation is happening. So it just goes and it's nothing that we really ever worry about. Uh, typically I go through and I'm tasting these wines and checking the numbers on them on a regular basis anyway. So if something seems out of whack, it's easy for me to smell and taste and I can always run the num take it to an independent lab, run the numbers, see where it's at. Uh, this is just a very natural part of red wine making, something that, like I mentioned, the vast majority of red wines go through just kind of is what it is it just depends on how quickly you want it to get it done and whether or not you're inoculating for it or not i can't say there's really a benefit to inoculating or not unless you just want to get it done or if your wine's kind of at a chemical level a little bit more unstable it's probably better that you knock this out this out sooner rather than later uh, to make sure that your wine stays as stable as possible now basically honestly that's the heavy lifting. The vast majority of like the wine making process we just went through. Now, once you're into this aging process and the malactic conversion is done and the primary fermentation is done and you're in barrels or tanks or whatever you're aging your wine in, you're just kind of sitting and waiting. You're checking up on the wine on a regular basis, but there are a couple of key things that you need to do. And this is racking. Racking right here is important because it helps remove the heavy sediment from those barrels. So they have the illustration of like different hoses and things right here. And this is basically uh, what we'll do. Um, you can ignore the filtration and fining side of things. Uh, this is something that it's a bit of a rabbit hole to go down. We'll touch on it briefly here. I'll definitely get into it in a little bit more detail later. Uh, but for our purposes, rackings will happen typically in January after harvest maybe in the springtime or the late summer before harvest. So twice a year, typically. If a wine does need more air or if there's a lot of heavy sediment buildup, we'll do it a third time. But it's more of a judgment call on my part. If the wine is tasting great and it doesn't need to be moved around, then we won't move it around. If it need, if it's tasting like it needs a good splash of air and we can you know, move it from one barrel to another to accommodate that, then we do it. This is very much a stylistic consideration for myself. Uh, many people will have kind of a more of a schedule of like, hey, we rack our wines here, here, and here throughout the year to make sure that this happens. I just taste through the barrels. There's not really a set time every year except for after the fermentation, that after that last harvest. So if we have new wines, this is what we get into typically in January. The following year after harvest, all the new wine that's in barrel, we're going to start racking it. And what we have is basically a stainless steel pipe that's an L shape that goes down into the bottom of the barrel. Uh, there's a little attachment on it that will keep the bottom of that pipe up above the heavy sediment that has settled at the bottom. That way we can pump basically all the clean wine out of that barrel and leave the heavy sediment. All we have to do is rinse and clean out that barrel and then we can just boom, reuse it. Clean, simple. We don't have to use a filter to remove any of that sediment. It's just being done uh, because we're racking off the top of it. Um, we're just moving wine from one vessel to another to facilitate that. Very clean, very simple. Now, uh, when it comes to filtration and fining, uh, these are here because these are typical steps that you'll do before you do any bottling. Now, this is a bit of a rat's nest of things to get into. Uh, filtration can be anything from what's illustrated here, which is more of a pad filter, where you basically squeeze these kind of paper pads together and you force the wine through them. They are at a varying gauges, basically, where you can sterile filter them or do what we call as a, a bug catcher, which is more of just a, hey, we're gonna make sure that this you know, is clean wine. Uh, the sterile filtering is basically removing things at a very small level. I think it's, it's point, I think four or five micron. Uh, it's something that is 
it, it's, it removes basically anything and everything that could be growing in that wine, like any heavy solids for sure, um, and then things at a very, very small level. Um, you can also do carbon filtering. You can do reverse osmosis. Uh, there's all kinds of things you can do. Uh, the trick with filtration is that before you go to bottling, this is not just going to remove the stuff that you want it to. It's going to remove other things as well. Um, as much as folks want to kind of lean on filtration isn't a huge thing and it doesn't make a difference, it certainly does. Now, it's not going to make a wine better or worse. It's simply going to make it different than it was before. Now, and if you have the option of doing this because your wine is potentially set up to fail because it could potentially spoil, then yeah, you need to do this. Um, if the chemistry comes back on it and it's great and you're not having any issues, then maybe you're just adding a low dose of sulfites as a preservative and you're not doing as much filtration. Uh, this, this is super variable depending on the chemistry, kind of what you're looking at, how shelf stable you want your wine to be typically. Finding agents, I'm not even gonna touch this just yet. This is gonna be a whole episode in and of its own. Uh, there are all kinds of things that we can use uh, when it comes to finding a wine. Uh, there's a kind of a, a couple of terms coined by Robert Parker back in the day that it was unfined and unfiltered. Basically that a wine was just kind of the raw wine after being racked and it was bottled. Uh, typically that means there's a little bit more sediment in those wines. Typically that means you're, you know, quote unquote, keeping the wine as natural as possible, but realistically you've already manipulated a bunch through the winemaking process, so I don't buy that. Uh, but the finding agents are, there's all kinds of stuff. Uh, we're gonna go through probably a list of half a dozen of these, just the tip of the iceberg, uh, to kind of show you what can be done uh, when it comes to finding agents. Uh, but this is something that a lot of people do. Uh, I've done it in the past uh, as well in certain situations. Um, it's something that is uh, interesting because this is definitely where you start getting into a little bit more of, you know, this, this section right here is for me personally, where you get a little bit more into the manufacturing side of things in wine rather than the art form. This becomes a little bit more wine by numbers rather than by, you know, just your olfactory senses. Um, although, you know, this finding thing can also help enhance or, you know, not <laughs> some of those characteristics as well. So this can be used to add or take away complexity in your wine too. So there's a lot to be said for that. Uh, now, I did want to touch on one last thing uh, because we've mentioned it a couple times through this kind of middle part and the main part of this winemaking process. And that is the bottom line on sulfites in wine. So this comes from Wine Folly as well. Um, realistically, what are sulfites and are they bad for me? That's always the question is, are you sensitive to them or aren't they? Now, this is sulfites in wine and how it in essence measured up. Um, so everything here is measured in parts per million. Uh, and you can see here that a dry red wine is at the bottom of this scale. Dried fruit, French fries, frozen juices, prepared soup, packaged meals, soda, commercial wines, a little bit higher, as you might expect, because they need to be they're more preservatives from, for them to be more shelf stable. That checks out. Uh, jams, candies, basically anything else that contains sulfites is going to have more than wine, typically. Um, you can look this up on numerous different websites. You don't have to just use Wine Folly for this. Um, this is the standard basically is that wine has an incredibly low dose of sulfites commercial wines will typically have more because they have to be shelf stable and be shipped around the country and around the world but that's kind of you know using uh like the fast food mentality is that you know to you know there's a reason why big mac tastes like a big mac and why it's the same every single time like it, this is how it is you know you have to use a certain level of preservatives and science to get to that point Anything that's a commercial product is going to be that way. You know, um, you know, red wine is no different. It really is up to, you know, the producer, how much they're adding, how shelf stable their wine needs to be. If it needs to be more, they're probably adding more. If they're not as worried about it, like us, then we don't add nearly as much. So this is just kind of the details of it. And I, I like touching on these details because this is important. Uh, 
their wine ranges from about five milligrams per liter up to 200 milligrams per liter. The legal limit is 350. Um, I've not personally tested a wine that was above like 60, personally. I'm sure they exist. I've not seen it. Um, you know, more often than not, if we're using sulfites, we're at about like 30 parts per million. Uh, and that's because our pH level is pretty low, which brings me to the next point, is that wines with lower acidity need more sulfites because that higher pH, at a pH of 3.6 and above, wines are much less stable and sulfites are necessary for shelf life. This is one of the big things that I focus on when it comes to harvesting. And when I decide to pick my grapes is where that pH level is at. As soon as it starts to creep higher, I know that I'm going to have to use more sulfites to make sure that wine is stable and stays stable. If I don't want to have to add as many, I can harvest earlier, keep the acidity higher, the pH lower, and less is more when it comes to sulfites in that realm. This is a huge part of what I do, um, not because I'm against sulfites. I think they're a, a great tool. But realistically, I'm of the opinion that less is more when it comes to adding things to wine. And this is the one thing that I add to wine outside of yeast. And if I can, don't have to add nearly as much of it, then I don't. It's really that simple. Um, this is really, you know, kind of an overview of the science behind it. Uh, you can look this up in all kinds of places. Um, you know, sulfites, again, it's it just they are kind of what they are they're ubiquitous in the wine beverage industry or the food and beverage industry including wine including fast food um you know including stuff that you just find canned in the grocery store um so you know our our reference point typically is that if you've had a glass of orange juice recently you've had more sulfites that are in a bottle of wine that's typically the rule of thumb so um this is something that is a tool very much for us to make sure our wines don't spoil, uh, you know, they just kind of, it's an, it's a, they're an antioxidant and they make sure your wines stay stable. You know, they're, they are a great tool to make sure that these wines can age a little bit longer than what they would if you didn't have them. Uh, you know, typically you can see this as well with, you know, wines with more color, like red wines, uh, typically need less than your white wines because as wines oxidize, these bind up and they, you know, dissipate. Uh, so, you know, you white wines, you typically want to keep them clear, very bright, very fresh looking. So typically you're going to use a little bit more sulfites to prevent that oxidative process from happening. Again, very top line stuff. Uh, wines with higher sugar content. Uh, this is something that is interesting because sugar is rampantly used within commercial wines. Uh, there's a lot of sugar, a lot more than you might expect in commercially made wines. Uh, so as a result, you typically need more sulfites to prevent a secondary fermentation of that remaining sugar. If you have sugar in your wine and it goes into bottle, there's a very good chance it's going to start re-fermenting. Why do I know this? Because it's happened to me before. Uh, I read a lab report wrong. No joke, we bottled up some Riesling and it started getting fizzy through the summer months because a secondary fermentation started happening and I, there weren't enough sulfites to act as a preservative. I completely screwed up as a winemaker not that many years ago. Uh, and luckily there were ways to fix it and there was, you know, there was a solution to be had and we made the, you know, made some, you know, lemonade out of lemons when it came to that. Uh, but this is something that is, you know, if there's going to be sugar in your wine, I, this kind of just goes without saying, realistically. Um, that's, you know, just a very brief touch on sulfites and kind of what they do for us. Um, realistically, they're a great asset. Uh, they're something that the vast majority of wines will contain. I know natural winemakers will prevent or you will not add them in any way, shape, or form, but that prevents some of those wines from being shelf stable. And as a result, a lot of natural wines don't last nearly as long as wines that are that contain them. Uh, it's typically why you drink natural wines sooner rather than later. They're not built to age nine times out of 10. So them is the ropes. All right, that pretty much does it. We covered a lot of geeky stuff today. Um, that's a really, really kind of top line overview in terms of winemaking, 
how we go about our business and you know what we do in MTGA from a production standpoint compared to kind of what the natural wine side of things does and also what the commercial side of wine things uh, you know how they operate uh, this is you know not uncommon and this is again why there are so many different types of wine out there why there are so many countries that make wine out there uh it's 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 very cool in my opinion because this allows us to have a ton of creativity and it's the reason why there are so many great wines for us to drink out there it's because you go through just that you know from fermentation to aging that's the first i mean that fermentation process to when we start aging is literally like two to three months it's the very beginning of the process and there's so much that we can do whether you're relying more on manufacturing whether you're relying uh, more on the art form and making a natural wine or wherever you're falling on that spectrum there's a lot of things that you that can be done to make a wine better or worse in your opinion the one takeaway that I hope you get from this is that there's no wrong way to make wine. There are going to be things that you prefer for sure, right? There are going to be certain styles of wine and winemaking that are going to hit your taste buds the right way, and you're going to enjoy those styles more than other styles. And when you start talking about some of these techniques, a cold soak to enhance the color of a wine, uh, a longer fermentation or an extended maceration to extract more structure or potentially, uh, you know, aging in new oak versus used oak, whether that malactic conversion is happening or not. You know, these are all things that we can talk about to really help, hopefully, kind of enhance not just your knowledge of wine and winemaking, but also to give you, you know, some other questions to ask. The next time you're out wine tasting or if you're out to dinner and you're asking a sommelier, hey, you know, I saw this dish and I want a wine to go with it. But I typically like, you know, Chardonnay that didn't go through a malactic conversion. I like it to be more, you know, I like I love Chardonnay, but I like to be crisp and refreshing. I don't like buttery. You know, that's where a lot of those terms and a lot of those kind of catchphrases that we use when it comes to describing wine come from is that that very beginning of the winemaking process because that kicks off stylistically what we are trying to do and how we want those grapes to taste when we finally bottle them up at the end of the process. So uh, again, a very, very top level overview of kind of the grand scheme of winemaking, kind of what we consider as we're going from grape to, you know, basically processing to the aging process. Um, if you have any questions for episodes in the future, uh, feel free to leave them down in the comment section. Um, I'll be checking them and compiling things. I do plan on doing kind of a monthly ask the winemaker at the end of every month. We'll post up basically the, you know, top three or five or so questions, however much time I have. Uh, I'm going to try and keep these episodes around like 30 to 45 ish minutes. We're a little over that right now, it looks like. Uh, but realistically, that's kind of why, where I want this to be. Uh, so any other questions I'm going to be addressing, and I'm going to do my best to address all of them as best as possible. I do have a list of topics that we're going to be getting into. Uh, this includes uh, barrel selection and barrel tasting in particular, and what we do and how we go about barrel tasting, kind of what it means for us as winemakers. Uh, two will be those finding agents that we were talking about. Three are going to be additives. That's going to be a really fun one. That third one, when it comes to additives and extracts and concentrates and things that are used within the broader wine industry, uh, that's going to be a really fascinating one that is going to basically, I'm pulling back the curtain on the Wizard of Oz and being like, there he is. Talk to the man. <laughs> Let's get after it. Um, so that's going to be a great one. Uh, we will dive more into harvest and picking considerations, uh, what I look for when we're looking to harvest, uh, what other folks are looking for, and how we kind of adapt and overcome uh, the weather and what mother nature does when it comes to a growing season. So uh, we really kind of have those four things to kick off this year. Um, there's going to be all kinds of other stuff that we're going to dive into um, as time goes on. So I appreciate you tuning in. Uh, be sure to hit subscribe 
if you haven't already, be sure uh, to hit subscribe. That way you get notifications as to when new episodes are posted up. Uh, again, thank you so much for tuning in. Any questions, comments, anything that we can do to hopefully improve what we're doing, feel free to leave those down below in the comment section as well. I'll make sure to leave the links to any references, whether it's Wine Folly, uh, UC Davis, Decanter Magazine, I mean, whatever resources we're using, those links will all be down below in the description. Uh, that way, if there's any kind of continuing education that you want to go forth and do, you can have at it. So thank you again. We'll see you next time.